Uh, Rick has a distinguished uh, career. He's now co-professor of ornithology at Yale University, where he's been since 2004, I think. <clears throat> Before that, he was a professor at University of Kansas in Lawrence, in Lawrence, Kansas. He got his PhD from University of Michigan and graduated from Harvard, I think, in 1982, which is, I think, somehow where we first met up because I left Massachusetts and moved to California at about that time. <clears throat> anyway, I've followed his career with great interest. He uh, studies broad issues in the evolution of birds, including the evolution of birds from their ancestors, the theropod dinosaurs, which include Tyrannosaurus and other characters featured in the Jurassic Park movies. <clears throat> and he, he studies phylogeny of birds, how, how different families are related to one another, um, where they originated, how they spread from the place they originated. Um, he's also particularly recently focused a lot on the evolution of feathers. Now, um, any five-year-olds in our audience could probably assure you that birds evolved from dinosaurs, one, and also that many dinosaurs, as has recently been determined, had feathers. <clears throat> and um, it, in fact, I, could, I can recommend um, there, are, there are a number of places, including various natural history museums, that produce these great Tyrannosaurus chicks with feathers, you know, stuffed animals with feathers popping out of their heads that make great toys. Um, anyway, the, the, these things have led uh, Rick into the study of if dinosaurs had feathers, if bird had, had feathers, what are feathers for? I mean, clearly they're great for insulation. Uh, they're great for flying. Tyrannosaurs didn't fly that well, but birds do. But they also, he, he, I'm sure he will outline how he can tell, let, you know, all know now that uh, feathers have lots of colors, but dinosaur feathers also were colored. If something's got color, that immediately implies that it can, the color itself can convey some sort of information to those who can see the color. <clears throat> and um, Rick has studied particularly um, an issue uh, called sexual selection. We're, we're very well posed here on Nantucket to uh, understand the concept of sexual selection, particularly following the Fagawi weekend. <laughs> but ju ju just to refresh your memory, this is, this is an idea, Darwin uh, spent a lot of time uh, talking about this issue. The idea is that you have members of one sex that choose or make decisions about potential mates based on the quality of the mate, uh, adornments, feathers, other things, Gucci loafers. You, um, and and there, you know, if, if you have one sex choosing mates Based on those sort of characters, there's immediately the possibility of lying. Um, if I bear, buy a pair of Gucci loafers and, um, you know, I want people to see that. I'm sending a signal of some sort. What is that signal? That I have resources, like money, that, um, you know, I will be a, uh, a loving and caring spouse, that I will provide for large numbers of children that will subsequently spread my genes around the country? Or might it be something else? And um, I think that's what uh, Rick's here to tell you about. So please welcome uh, Dr. Richard Prum. <laughs> Great. Um, thank you. Thanks very much, uh, Rick. And thank you very much as well to the, uh, to the uh, uh, Nantucket Book Festival. It's a great pleasure to be here and to speak in this historic building and to see so many exciting readers, excited readers here. Uh, what a great institution. Uh, so it's a pleasure to be here. Um, yes, yeah, so I'm uh, eager to be talking uh, about uh, this aesthetic view of life, um, uh, a, a way of scientific uh, thinking that has become central in, in, in my worldview and one that I've uh, been trying to share. Um, I want to start by just framing this as a kind of bird-watching science. Um, you know, Ernst Rutherford, a famous uh, early 20th century uh, uh, physicist, said, all science is either physics or stamp collecting. And, and this has been maybe one of the most famous put-downs in the history of, of, of science. And yet, um, I'm 
increasingly realizing and actually becoming increasingly proud of the fact that my career in ornithology is dedicated to proving that Rutherford is right. And, but also transforming what people think of as stamp collecting. Because biodiversity is really composed a whole series of individuals. Individuals like you and me. Individuals like homologs, like my arm and an arm of a bat and the arm of a, of a, of a bird. Uh, or, uh, or clades, branches on the tree of life, like birds or dinosaurs or flowering plants. These are all kinds of uh, individuals. And individuals don't follow uh, laws in the same way that the laws of physics are designed to study. And as a consequence, we have uh, a new um, uh, uh, or emergent sciences of individuality, right? And bird watching, natural history, the study of the individuality of organisms is one of those. So this is bird watching science, right? Um, and the more you know about, I'm, I'm glad uh, uh, it was mentioned, the, uh, uh, the uh, dispute in the literature, these uh, negative reviews are great for me. Uh, <laughs> And, and one of the reasons, uh, uh, I, I spoke with uh, Jonathan Weiner, the uh, author of Beak of the Finch, famous, great, fantastic book uh, on, on Darwin's Finch's evolution, and he said, wow, I really loved it. I'm so, I mean, is, is this a straw man? Are you making up this whole antagonistic relation between your views? And, and, all, and luckily, all I had, a new review had just come out. I said, see? And he said, uncle, okay. Uh, so there is, there is a scientific debate, and, uh, uh, um, and uh, my... By framing this debate, and, or by framing my science as bird watching, I, I really am explicitly claiming a connection to natural history, to knowledge of birds uh, and their individuality. And I'm extending that to a new level, the individuals themselves, right? Uh, and their own sensory and cognitive evaluations. So the more you know about evolutionary biology, the more likely it is that you will disagree with me today. And so in order to earn your trust, I'm gonna start at the beginning. Um, <laughs> with your credibility. Uh, that's, that's little Ricky Prum. That's a, a sixth or seventh grade or so. Uh, in, I grew up in, uh, mostly in southern Vermont. Uh, of course, this uh, image is embarrassing for many ways, many reasons, but especially for the glasses. Uh, they may be retro cool somewhere, but they certainly weren't in, in, in Manchester, Vermont in 1974. Uh, but um, the glasses are actually special because uh, I first put on a, a pair of glasses in, in, in fourth grade. And within a few short months, I was a bird watcher. Um, I had no idea what science lay ahead or what it even was, uh, other than a sort of established knowledge that you found in books. But indeed, at that age, I already knew that I would be engaged in birds. One of the interesting things about starting a life list as a birder is that you realize, well, this was my whole life. It's, you know where you'll be however long you live. You'll be looking at birds. So now uh, I'm... Uh, uh, unfit for any other kind of employment, and luckily there are places like Yale and the Yale Peabody uh, that have, uh, you know, places for people like me. Um, when I got to college, uh, that was the, I discovered that evolutionary biology was the area of biology, the areas of science that was about the questions that I had been most inherently or innately interested in, the origins and maintenance of biodiversity, how, uh, how species have become different, why they live where they live, why they live like they do, and all those sorts of things. And this is me, uh, you know, I've, I've been trying to combine this bird watching and science for forever, and this is uh, me recording bird songs in the Andes in, in, in grad school. And that's led to my messy office at Yale, where somehow science still <laughs> manages to come out of, of that on occasion. So, uh, as Dick mentioned there, I've been working a lot on different uh, topics in bird biology, including the evolution of plumage, uh, origin of feathers, dinosaur origins, uh, the physics of color, uh, like these blue colors, the chemistry of the purples, uh, and lots of other things. And unfortunately, I actually won't get to the, to the color of the dinosaur fossil feathers today. Uh, uh, you gotta make choices. Uh, in, in any case, um, but I, for many years, I thought this was just a lot of weird stuff that Rick is into. In fact, I had no need for a worldview um, because I, it seemed to be working just fine without one. Uh, but then I realized that a lot of the information that I was, a lot of the things I was curious about were related to one big question. And that question is the evolution of beauty. And by beauty, I don't mean beauty to me or beauty to us as we might see when examining the Skatinga and be motivated therefore to study uh, birds or ornithology, uh, but, bird, uh, but beauty to the birds themselves. 
and to the scientific hypothesis that birds are beautiful because they are beautiful to themselves and that they are agents in their own evolution through their own social and sexual choices, through their own individual choices, right? And uh, it's this aesthetic agency uh, that is at the heart of the, the book and at heart of uh, my, my, own, my own research. Now I'm gonna start with a, a, a video of the Birds of Paradise. This is a superb bird of paradise. Um, this is a video taken by my former student, uh, Ed Scholes, now at Cornell. And uh, the bird is giving a display. These are polygynous birds, right? The female does all the nesting uh, on her own. And she visits among available males. And you'll see in a moment that the male undergoes an incredible transformation in response to her visit. Right? Th those blues are actually a photonic device, nanoscience of the birds. Right? Those, those black feathers are super black. We just described these structures in, in, uh, in, in nature communications. They're among the blackest objects in nature, right? Now, here we can see both the complexity of beauty, but we can introduce the challenge, the intellectual challenge. Was that, but as uh, uh, most of my colleagues in evolutionary bio biology believe, that beauty like this evolves because it communicates information about quality, objective information like who are his people? Does he come from a good egg, right? Does he, does he have a good diet? Does he take care of himself? Will he take care of me and my offspring in species where there's a pair bond? Or uh, uh, does he smoke? Or what is he smoking, right? These are all the kinds of things that organisms might need to know, right? Practical. Now in this view, beauty in nature is another path to utility, another kind of adaptation, right? And, and, and some people, or basically most of the field, has relished this unification of beauty with adaptation. But for some reason, the way I combined that bird-watching roots with my science have led me to be attracted to an entirely different class of ideas, right? That birds are beautiful because they, or birds, these sorts of ornaments evolve because they are beautiful to the birds themselves, because of the pleasure that they produce in the choosers. Right? Um, this kind of aesthetic science where requires that we embrace the subjective experiences of animals as, a, an, a, as the center of our, of our science. And what I mean here is the flow of sensory experience that contribute to the, to the behavior and to the choices of the animal. So here we can imagine the diversity of the sensory worlds, or what the ethologists call the umwelt of these different animals, right? So we have the sonic uh, a, a sonar constructed world of the bat, or the olfactory complexity of the mole. Or down there on the left, we have the more mirrored fish, which lives in murky rivers in Africa, and senses the world with electrical fields, and actually sings electrical courtship songs that vary in frequency and in, and in rhythm, like music, but in an entirely different kind of wave. Right? Now, we obviously can't sense what this is like. We can relate a lot to the bird, uh, which communicates, fortunately for me, uh, in color and, in, uh, and acoustically, right? both sensory modalities that humans have evolved as well. So, so the subjective experience becomes the focus of our science, not something we are trying to explain away as a path toward adaptive utility. So in order to make this into a science, I need to define my, my or framework, and what I think of aesthetic evolution, this kind of distinct mode of evolution, is an emergent consequence of three things. Sensory perception, cognitive evaluation, and choice. And whenever those things occur on a social or on a, uh, 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 on a heritable substrate through either social or genetic mechanisms, then what we have is a new kind of evolution, in which case the, the Features that evolve, evolve because they function in the brains of observing individuals, not in the physical or real world, right? And so as a result, um, uh, I am also trying uh, as well to bring beauty back into the sciences, right, as a legitimate subject of science itself. And in order to do that, uh, uh, like all aesthetic philosophers from Plato up through Kant through the moderns, I need a concept of beauty that does some work for me. So here it is. Beauty is a co-evolved attraction, not just any sort of attraction or desire, an attraction which, in which the form of the desire and the object of desire have shaped one another over time through a kind of intimate interaction 
right, through a, a, an entrainment, a historical entrainment. So the object, the, the, the beauty is not merely in the eye of the beholder, but in the coevolved eye of the beholder, right? Uh, and, and, and in this case, can, uh, can radiate. Now, uh, my, these ideas are not new. They go back to uh, Charles Darwin, uh, and they're actually some of the original framework of, of evolutionary biology. Darwin, after publishing The Origin of Species, uh, in which he described uh, for the first time the idea of the, of the tree of life uh, and adaptation by natural selection, um, had a, a number of persistent problems. He had no theory of genetics uh, or inheritance. He had no theory of the origin of people. And he had no theory of, for the origin of what he called impracticable beauty. So he wrote to New Englander and botanist Asa Gray uh, at that time, the sight of a feather in a peacock's tail makes me sick. Um, and he looks a little sick in that picture, I think, don't you? <laughs> and I think we would now recognize Darwin in the modern era to be a somaticizer. He's somebody who took his intellectual problems and turned them into bo you know, body disturbances, right? He was well known for his, for his digestive distress. Um, but he didn't rest on his laurels as having discovered perhaps the most profound idea in science of the 19th century, adaptation. Instead, he wheeled around in a foxy way and created an entirely alternative or new or novel mechanism for evolution, which he called sexual selection. And he published that in The Descent of Man and Selection in Relation to Sex in 1871. Now, sexual selection included two mechanisms, one mating competition, usually male-male competition, which give rise to armaments or, ornament, or, sorry, armaments or large body size, basically instruments of social control over reproduction. And then his other hypothesis was mate choice by one, of one sex of, uh, of members of the other sex in order to uh, decide on who to mate with. And I'll be focusing on that mate choice for the rest of today. Now, in, interestingly, in his description of mate choice, Darwin used explicitly aesthetic language. That is the language of everyday artistic uh, uh, evaluation and aesthetic experience. So he described these biological features, the preferences, mating preferences of individuals, as an aesthetic faculty, a taste for the beautiful, or as standards of beauty, right? And, uh, and then he also proposed that sexual selection by mate choice was an independent uh, means, that is, not, by, uh, not a mechanism of adaptation. So he said, the most refined beauty may serve as a sexual charm and for no other purpose, right? And so, uh, in there, he says that no other purpose means no other adaptive advantage, right? So Darwin's view was also co-evolutionary in the way that I'm proposing. Here he has a description of the Argus pheasant. The male Argus acquired his beauty gradually through preference of females during many generations for more highly ornamented males. The aesthetic capacity of females advanced through exercise or habit, just as our own taste is gradually improved. So here you see both sides responding and evolving together to a specific and indeed arbitrary establishment of what is beauty in that species, right? So this was an aesthetic view, an arbitrary view, and in one way, a very modernistic view. In other words, there weren't objective standards of beauty, but ones that were arrived at in this, uh, by this historical process. So Darwin's idea that mate choice or that uh, male-male competition structured the social and sexual world was so congruent with Victorian uh, culture that it was a big winner. And actually, I think it contributed greatly to the acceptance of evolutionary biology as uh, a concept in, in, at that time. However, his idea that mate choice, in particular female mate choice, uh, uh, was a force in nature was a big loser. Right? Uh, and there were many, many critiques of it. People didn't think that animals had the cognitive complexity or sensory complexity to do this. Uh, other uh, critiques were explicitly misogynistic, right? Uh, there were lots of critics. However, his most organized and persistent critic was Alfred Russell Wallace. And this is ironic because Wallace was the co-discoverer, really, of adaptation by natural selection. And really, uh, they were companions in this broader war uh, to, or broader uh, uh, effort to establish evolutionary science. But Wallace was a special creationist. He believed that humans 
uh, mind and soul had been injected, if you will, into human evolution by God in an act of special creation. So he was dedicated to the idea of a huge, uh, an irrevocable, and actually non-scientific non gulf or distance between humans and the natural world. And that led him to a vigorous anger and a, a, a real pursuit against uh, sexual selection. Wallace said many crazy things. Uh, for example, he said, well, if you look at the liver and the spleen, they're all brilliantly colored. So when you look at a peacock, you're just seeing the same processes, the, you know, the vigor of life on the outside. Now, of course, this is crazy, right? And, and this is what Wallace is mostly known for today. Uh, his critiques were so strong that, uh, that you know, uh, sexual selection by mate choice was rejected for almost an entire uh, uh, century. Um, but Wallace was never able to put it away. He never could actually uh, convince people that the peacock wasn't beautiful to a peahen, right? And so he needed a new effort. And here, when we see when he couldn't uh, uh, get rid of sexual selection, uh, what he said. He said, here he is in a section of a book called Natural Selection, Neutralizing Sexual Selection. He said, the only way we can account for the observed facts, that is ornament, like the peacock's tail, is by supposing that color and ornament are strictly correlated with health, vigor, and general fitness to survive. So this is fascinating because Wallace is credited with having killed sexual selection for an entire century. And here he is articulating the idea that is at the heart of almost all papers written today in sexual selection. It's as if this sense could be in any of hundreds of papers published in the last year, or indeed in that review in Ardea uh, of my book, right? Uh, and, and so what we have here is the origin of the idea that beauty is utility, right? That it includes information about quality. So, and, and to Wallace, what that meant is that it was just a kind of natural selection, and therefore we should get rid of sexual selection. Well, what was he getting rid of? What he was getting rid of was the aesthetic, the idea that there was some role for pleasure or, 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 or the individual choices in, in the matter. Now, Wallace and Darwin fought about this until Darwin's death in 1883. But Wallace lived until literally into the dawn of the First World War. And so Wallace had a predominant impact on what happened uh, in the 20th century. So here, uh, after Darwin died in 1883, six years later, Wallace wrote the book Darwinism, where in the introduction he writes, even in rejecting that phase of sexual selection depending on female choice, I insist upon the greater efficacy of natural selection. This is preeminently the Darwinian doctrine, and therefore I claim for my book the position of being the advocate of pure Darwinism. Now here Darwin's been dead for six years, and Wallace is claiming to be more Darwinian than Darwin. Right? Now, it's more than 130 years later, and I'm still pissed. <laughs> and I hope that you will be too. Because what happened was that we have been denied, uh, as both a science and a culture, of the actual richness and complexity uh, of Darwin's thought. Darwinism today is a flattened, uh, a compressed, diminished view, diminished version of Darwin's own view of nature. Right? Uh, so what really happened was that Wallace may have lost the battle over credit for the origin of natural selection, the discovery of that idea, and I think rightly so. However, he won the battle over what evolutionary science would become in the 20th century, which was a field dedicated to the idea of adaptationism, the insistence of the greater efficacy of natural selection. Right? And, 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 and so many aspects of what was happened in evolutionary science from the, uh, the loss of phylogeny, uh, the elimination of uh, developmental biology, uh, eugenics, et cetera, all relate to this, to this moment and, and to this effort. And so really, uh, one of the missions of the book is to bring back uh, this richer, more complicated, and I, I, indeed, I think, uh, a more accurate uh, uh, view of Darwin or, or Darwinism uh, that was authentically Darwinian. Now, at this point in my uh, lectures, in a more scientific context, I would dive into the genetics, uh, where I would show some mathematical models for how the covariance between genes for traits and preference arise in the Landy Kirkpatrick version of the Fisher model. Uh, we're gonna skip all that. <laughs> and I hope at the coffee, breakfast tomorrow, the rest of your life, to give you uh, uh, um, uh, an analogy that will allow you to see the difference between the Wallacean and the Darwinian, uh, the honest advertisement view and the fully aesthetic view 
of, uh, of, of, of nature. And uh, I'm gonna do that by comparing the origin of the value of beauty to the value of money. Where does value come from? Well, in money, the value of the dollar originally arose uh, because we were on the gold standard. So a dollar had value because it stood in lieu of a tiny piece of gold in Fort Knox, right? And so under this uh, 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 mechanism, the value of the dollar is extrinsic. It's not in the money, it's in the gold. Now don't ask why gold's valuable, we won't go there. Uh, anyway, so the value is extrinsic, right? However, we're not on the gold standard anymore. In fact, every currency on the planet, from dollars to Bitcoin, has abandoned the gold standard. So where does the value of money come from? Well, in the memorable phrase of Paul Samuelson, uh, the value of money is a social contrivance. It arises because we people, as a group, in aggregate, invest some value in the money. There's no longer any gold. Under this mechanism, the value of money is intrinsic. It's the money itself, right? And, and so what does this have to do with biology? I believe that my evolutionary colleagues, most of them, are, are like gold bugs. They're on the gold standard, right? And they actually think that any questioning of the gold standard, they respond to, just like economic gold bugs, as an irrational flight from reason. Right? And, and, uh, uh, and so there goes the review in Ardea and recent reviews by Borgia and Animal Behavior of the book. These are the gold bugs, right? But nature, I don't think, is on the gold standard, right? And, uh, and, and, and indeed, we know that value can, can be contrived in, in absence of it. So all of the mathematics I've skipped is basically the genetic mechanism for how that contrivance arise whether through genetic or social or uh, cultural mechanisms in nature. Now, um, you know, my scientific papers in this view have gone back to almost a decade now. Uh, and, you know, from a scientific perspective, from a professional perspective, they have, you know, 100, 150 citations. This is very healthy. Unfortunately, no one cites it for the content of the paper. Uh, and so what that means is, uh, you know, my banner headlines, the Landy Kirkpatrick Null Model, is a big loser. And so I have a new mantra now, <laughs> and that's beauty happens. The way to describe this, what happens when we're not on the gold standard, is that beauty happens, right? when there's uh, uh, sensory perception, cognitive evaluation, and choice, then beauty happens, right? And that's, that's, the, that's, the, that's the goal here. So how do we progress in science today? Well, uh, I, uh, I'm going to uh, propose, and these, a lot of this is in the book and must have really contributed to the ire of that Ardea reviewer, though he didn't mention the leprechaun in his review. I, uh, I don't know why. Uh, I, I'm gonna compare my, uh, my uh, evolutionary colleagues to leprechauns. Right? What does the leprechaun say? Well, the, uh, my colleagues believe that uh, the peacock's tail is like a rainbow leading to a pot of gold, a pot of extrinsic benefits that include good genes. You see the DNA helices over there, right? Uh, and, and worms and, uh, and no sexually transmitted diseases, right? These are the benefits of, of beauty, right? Which are outside the beauty. Well, the Darwinian view, my view, is that most of the time, the beauty of the rainbow is just a rainbow. There's no gold, right? And so ask yourself, where's the burden of proof? Who should, who should be uh, given the special hurdle of actually having to establish uh, the truth? What is the null model? What is our expectation of nature, right? Uh, and, and I indeed think that beauty happens is the null model. So that if a, if a, if a another way to say this is if, if a, uh, uh, um, uh, a leprechaun comes up to you and says, hey, there's a pot of gold at the end rainbow, your appropriate response should be, show me the money, right? <laughs> there's no money unless they, the burden of proof is on the leprechaun to demonstrate that, right? And I hope by putting the leprechaun hat on Alfred Russell Wallace <laughs> that none of you will be ever able to forget uh, th this idea. And I think uh, uh, that effective mechanism has contributed to some of the energy of reviews of the book. Now. All right, it's a little loud. Turn that down just a little bit if we could. We need it back up for the later sound, but this is, so this is an Argus pheasant, the bird that, uh, 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 that Darwin talked about. Uh, the Argus pheasant is about six feet long uh, and lives in Southeast Asia. It's another polygynous bird where the female takes all the kids. There she is. This is actually taken in a zoo because they're so hard uh, to get in the wild. Now here's a, another visit of how complicated uh, beauty is in the world. 
you can see the male is pretty much uh, drab, mottled brown, but he transforms himself during display. This, uh, what was dryly called by scientists the frontal inverted movement or something, it, it, it actually looks like uh, the wings have been blown out like an inverted umbrella in a high wind here in Nantucket. But what you see on those secondary feathers attached to the man's upper wing are a series of golden balls, spherical balls. And they're created through, as we'll see in a moment, pigment patches. There's a white streak on the top that looks like the, um, the specular reflectance off the top of an apple that tells you that shiny spot, which tells you that the, that the apple is round. And then there's, at the bottom of each one, there's a little uh, a smudgy mark, right, which acts, looks like the shadow. So these are an optical illusion. And that's a special thing because there's nothing about the, um, uh, the honest advertisement uh, theory that proposes that this optical illusion should be in any way special versus other ways of expressing quality, right? Now, there's something explicitly aesthetic about an optical illusion, right? Now, the first person to see this was Alfred, uh, was uh, William Beebe in the wild. Uh, William Beebe, who in early 20th century went to Borneo, studied pheasants his whole life, and went to Borneo and spent months trying to find the Argus pheasant and see it in the wild. He built a tree house, and he scared away one bird, built a blind by, the, by the, uh, uh, the, the display site, scared away another. And finally, he had his workers dig a foxhole in the ground. And every day before dawn, he got in the foxhole and was covered with sticks, fighting the leeches and the mosquitoes for an entire week until he saw this display. Right? Now, he's practically having a religious experience at this point, I think it's fair to say. Um, but he turns his attention to the hen, to the female, and he said, I would like to believe, in his writings that, uh, on pheasants, he said, I would like to believe what Darwin said. Uh, but it's clear to me that any aesthetic impact from that display is wasted on that little hen. <laughs> and I think what happened here was a kind of perverse uh, anthropomorphism. You know, he's having a religious experience. He's, you know, but, but what's happening, what, what is she doing? She's dryly considering. This, that's what I refer to as cognitive evaluation. In fact, the aesthetic view tells us that behind every elaborate ornament in nature is an equally elaborate, co-evolved cognitive concept about what beauty is, right? And so we should really be imagining her as a hard-nosed curator or art collector at a high-end gallery. Are they going in weeping at the art? No, they're sitting back going, huh, I wonder if that's good, right? Because, because her agency, her Hard-nosed aesthetic choices are the ones that drive this. This is so extraordinary and beautiful because of female choices. In fact, probably the, uh, the sexual success in species like this is like the income distribution in America today. 1% of the males are getting 50% of the copulations. Another 5, 10% are getting another 20, 30, 40% of the copulations. And then there's the other split down. So probably about half the males in species like this never mate in their lives, right? So this is an extremity of failure, is related to the extremity of aesthetic expression, right? This is one way of considering um, the observation that most poems that have ever been written really suck, <laughs> right? You know, and, and that most operas that have ever been composed are unlistenable, right? In other words, the the aesthetic stringency of these art forms leads to uh, ex uh, extremity in those few and select uh, items that actually fulfill those successfully, who are really transcendent, right? So um, this aesthetic consideration uh, leads, to, uh, uh, leads uh, again, to a better understanding of this kind of diversity. So let's look at, there's the eye spots themselves. This is the, the three-dimensional glowing orb uh, in each one. But there's an, an, there's an additional uh, um, um, dimension to their, to their um, um, to optical illusions. And that is that the, the, the spots on the left is from directly above the feather. You can see that the size of the spheres scales with the width of the feather. One could consider that to be simply allometry, right? Uh, uh, regular scaling laws. But in fact, if we look at the feather from the foreshortened perspective of the female, these small spheres are closer to her eye, and the larger ones are further away. So they all converge on the same size. So not only is it 300 golden balls in the air, it's 300 golden balls of approximately the same size. 
right? And this is uh, encoded in the size through the development of the feathers in the bird, right? So this is the kind of aesthetic sweet spot that I think uh, creates enormous challenges for the adaptive view of, of, of mate choice. Uh, how's that, yeah. So here's another aesthetically extreme bird. This is in the mannequins, a family of South American polygynous birds that I've been st studied for years. This is the club-winged mannequin who's doing his uh, uh, courtship advertisement display. They live in Western Ecuador and, and Colombia. Now, I first saw this bird in, in 1985, and I was stunned by the quality of the sound. It's kind of a little violin-like or like feedback on a loudspeaker. And that's because this sound is a different kind of song. That's actually a wing song. The bird is singing with his wings. That's a big deal because birds have been singing with their vocal structure, the syrinx, for about 180, 180, or sorry, 100 or 80 million years ago, right? So that's a long time. And this bird has essentially abandoned tonal vocal communication for a wholly new way to, to sing. And that shows that sexual selection can be innovative. Even if it is arbitrary and not an adaptation, it can give rise to totally new things. That aesthetic innovation, it can be just as powerful a force in evolutionary biology as adaptation for new uh, practical functions. Well, it took us 20 years to figure out how this worked. <laughs> uh, and, and to make a long story short, this is the work of Kim Boswick, now also at, uh, at Cornell. And you can see in this high-speed movie, the feathers are oscillating over the back of the male at 100 cycles per second. Right? And how do they make the sound? Well, it turns out that the, the thickened secondary feathers, which give the club-winged mannequin its name, have special shapes. The fifth secondary on the lower left has a blade that bends over uh, uh, and reaches over and rubs against the bumps on the thickened sixth secondary. So uh, as it oscillates, it's rubbing. And it's like bowing a violin. It creates a mechanical stimulus. You can see as it goes uh, in from the top and out from the bottom, right, uh, back and forth, oscillating up and down, the, 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 the tip of the, of the darker, the gray fifth secondary, rakes over those little bumps, right? Creating a mechanical stimulation which makes that feather ring at the frequency of the sound, like, like a, a xylophone or like a, a, a violin string. Well, this is uh, amazing. This is the only bird known to stridulate. Stridulation is the way that crickets make the sound. So this could be called fairly a cricket-winged uh, mannequin as well. Well, in subsequent work, Kim studied uh, an, an additional, uh, actually, indeed, uh, uh, an, immor uh, an, 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 an immortal question, and that is, um, is beauty only skin deep? And the answer is no. In order to make the beautiful wing songs, the males have, have evolved an, an unusual uh, structure. And I'm going to step over and point to the slides here. Um, this is a, a CAT scan of a male, and this is down below is a cross section. You can see that the humerus, the upper arm bone, and the radius and the ulna, the, the, uh, the, the, the middle arm bones, are all white. They're absolutely solid. Solid like ivory, and that's a big deal because every bird on the planet, every flying bird on the planet has hollow wing bones. Heck, even Velociraptor and T-Rex have hollow limb bones, right? In other words, this is a feature of the body that predates the origin of birds and the origin of flight itself. Right? So that's extraordinary. They have really transformed their wing anatomy in order to sing these songs. Now, on the left, these three um, uh, um, uh, ulnas from the, uh, from, the, from the trailing edge of the, of the wing, this is where the feathers attach, are ulnas of other male mannequins. And on the right there is the club wing. So uh, extraordinarily wider. It's got thickened surface. It's got these big bumps for the attachments of ligaments to the feathers. Really quite extraordinary. And then in the next row, we can see that the density, it's got an order of magnitude more dense calcium. This is an incredible amount of investment in a waste of energy, right? This is only to sing a wing song. And it will clearly make the male worse at flying, right? But it's necessary because to sing these wing songs, he'll have an opportunity to pass his genes on, right? So um, mostly this could be described as, uh, by my adaptive evolutionary colleagues as, uh, as a kind of handicap. Uh, he's showing how good he is by wasting a lot of energy to make beauty in an especially costly way. But I wanted to test this hypothesis by asking, what about female club wing mannequins? How do they make the sound? Or how do they, uh, what, how do they evolve? 
Well, it turns out, to make a long story short, that on the right, the female club wing has the same wing bones as the male. Well, nearly the same, they're not, hollow, they're not solid, they're still hollow, but they have the same enormous size, width, et cetera. The problem here is that she will never sing a wing song. So where's the upside? Why does it evolve? Well, I call this the evolution of decadence. It's a new way or new implication for how the aesthetic can actually influence evolutionary process. So when the female selects the male she loves, you know, this beautiful you know, wing sound, uh, then of course her male offspring will inherit the weird wing bones that provide the capacity to make those attractive songs. So that's the indirect genetic benefit of mate choice that drives aesthetic evolution. Now her daughters, however, will also inherit those weird wing bones. Why is this? It turns out that wing bones develop in the embryo inside the egg before the egg has either become male or female. So there's no way as she changes the male that she cannot also change uh, the female. She, so her daughters will inherit genes for weirder wing bones. They will be made weir worse off. They will be less capable of flying. This will have direct costs in terms of their survival and fecundity. But those uh, 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 loss of, of fitness through the daughters will be matched by or uh, 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 exceeded by the sexual advantages of having attractive male offspring. Right. So why is this decadence? It's because every female choice can create, uh, uh, drive the species in a way that creates um, uh, uh, or makes everybody in the population worse off. Right. Now, I was talking to a, a uh, 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 a journalist about this a few months ago, and he said, wow, you seem kind of delighted at that prospect. <laughs> and I said, well, maybe a little bit, I guess. <laughs> but why, why, so why is this important? Well, what is important is when natural selection, adaptation by natural selection, and, and, and sexual selection by mate choice are operating in absolutely opposite directions, that you see the logic, the power of the Darwinian worldview that natural and sexual selection should be, should be uh, defined as, or as, as distinct evolutionary forces, which are potentially independent, but sometimes interacting, right? Uh, and the insufficiency of the Wallisian worldview. Why did it take until 2018 to come up with an example of decadence? Why isn't it clear that it could happen? Why wasn't it clear to Darwin, right? And the answer is that it, uh, uh, this obfuscation of the definition of sexual selection uh, contributes to the inability to see these kind of results. So I think these kinds of things are common in nature uh, and will soon be established to be common. Right? So, so this is a, uh, part has been about the aesthetic agency of animals and how it provides a, not only a richer, uh, more complicated, but more productive worldview in science. But now I want to turn to uh, uh, another troubling subject aspect. Five minutes? Oh, you can't tell me that. Oh, okay. Five minutes. Okay. So, so uh, 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 duck sex in five minutes. Okay. <laughs> this is problematic because over the years I've learned that duck sex is like a gas. It will expand to fill whatever volume you put it in. <laughs> and so, uh, so uh, maybe five minutes, maybe this is, a, this is an upside. Okay. Duck sex in five minutes. This is really about uh, sexual conflict. How Understanding the aesthetic agency of animals gives rise to a new understanding of what happens in the context when cho mate choice is, is infringed by social or sexual violence. Right? Now, it's not a happy topic, uh, but, uh, but, uh, but one uh, that, that, that uh, we're, um, I think is rewarding to examine. So in most ducks, what happens uh, is that the female chooses a mate based on co-evolved uh, um, uh, preferences. But as they migrate or go to the breeding grounds, we end up with trouble because they're unpaired males who then pursue uh, forced copulations, an alternative kind of reproductive strategy uh, that can be very damaging to the female. And this is made possible by the fact that males, uh, ducks still have a penis. Uh, most people don't think of birds having a penis and that's because most birds don't. But in fact, the penis evolved in the common ancestor of reptiles and, uh, reptiles and mammals. And so as a result, uh, the duck penis is homologous with the human penis. Uh, but it has many things that are different. Uh, for example, it can get very large. This is the Guinness Book of World Record Holders, uh, uh, the Argentine lake duck, which has a penis that's longer than the duck. 
what is with that? Well, uh, I did this research with Patty Brennan, who came to my lab saying that she wanted to work on the evolution of uh, you know, bird genitalia. And I thought, well, I'd never worked on that end of the bird before. I'm sure I'll learn a lot. And, uh, uh, but uh, actually, what I learned uh, turned out to uh, transform my idea uh, about science. Well, the duck penis itself, it, which is sort of uh, um, uh, one of the players in this story, is very unusual. It's stored inside the body most of the time. It is counterclockwise coiled. Uh, the erection is lymphatic instead of blood vascular. So what that means is that uh, um, uh, 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 erection and intromission are the same event, uh, and erection is very rapid. It also uh, it doesn't have an enclosed urethra. It just has an external groove called the sulcus. And the duck penis comes in smooth, ribbed, uh, 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 <laughs> branched, and even toothy or thorny varieties. Uh, to affect their ants. Now, in science, we aim to change lives, and this next slide will change your life if you've never seen a duck penis in action. But this is a, a, a slow-speed uh, movie, uh, a duck penis erecting. Uh, it takes a third of a second. Uh, the paper actually includes the, uh, the acceleration rate, uh, and you can see at the end here that the sulcus works just fine. Thank you. Um, uh, I want to point out that we're using uh, the metric side of the ruler, so that just shows this is really science, okay? This is <laughs> international units. So what's going on? Well, in species where there is no forced copulation, the penis is small and the, and the vaginal tract is simple on the left. But on the right, in species where there's a high frequency of forced copulation, then the penis evolves to be very elaborate and so does the vaginal morphology. In what way? Well, it turns out that the va vaginal structures have dead-end cul-de-sacs or pouches at the base, at the entrance of the, of, the, uh, of the vagina. And then above that, there are a series of counterclockwise or sorry, clockwise spirals. So this is an anti-sense spiral. So what this means is that female ducks have evolved an anti-screw device in their vaginal morphology. That what that Senate candidate, Tea Party candidate Todd Aiken said uh, about women have a way of shutting that whole thing down, referring to rape, is actually true of ducks, <laughs> but in a way that exposes something deeply uh, interesting. So what we show in the book is, uh, it, what I described in the book was a, a marvelous thing, going to the, um, the Yale uh, uh, glass blowing shop and telling me we needed glass vaginas for ducks. Um, <laughs> anyway, that's what these are. On the left are male-like and on the right are female-like. And what we showed is that the erection occurs uh, in, 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 in the same rate and same speed as air in, on the, in the two tubes on the left, but fails over 80% of the time in the right, right? So that means that female vaginal tracts are actually functioning in this way. What this means is that sexual autonomy matters to animals, right? There is something it is like to have freedom of choice, and there are evolutionary consequences when freedom of choice is infringed by uh, sexual violence and coercion. Now, I think of this as a profoundly feminist discovery in science, right, that has only come about from the fact of the aesthetic view, which recognizes the agency, doesn't explain away female choices, but, it, but, but seeks to understand them and discovers a, a new way of looking at nature. Now, I'm going to close with some comments about bowerbirds. They do a whole different thing. They, this is a, uh, but, uh, well, the, the problem with ducks, of course, is that it leads to an arms race. The penis gets bigger, the vagina gets more complicated, everybody pays the cost, but the females are still staying in control of fertilization. But in, in the bowerbirds pursue a different path. They, this is, the bowerbirds are polygynous, the, male does, the female does all the nesting, and the male build this structure. The structure is not a nest, it's a bower. It's a seduction theater, and it has just one seat, and the male, the male ornaments it with, in this case, feathers. In this case, this is a guy from uh, West Australia. Uh, he's a, a couple uh, kilometers from the ocean and uh, a fantastic uh, shorebird place called Broom. Uh, and in that ocean, there's a cliff. And on the edge, of the, or in the middle of the cliff is a stratum. And in the middle of the stratum are fossils. So this guy's ornamented with fossil uh, uh, clamshells, right? So uh, as a... Uh, as a museum curator myself, I kind of relate to this invertebrate paleontologist. Uh, when he's singing his song, he's literally saying, do you want to come over and see my fossil collection? <laughs> but what happens, what happens in this case is that he's, he's sitting in the, that's the, where the, fe that's the male, but when he sits in the female, the female sits there, and the male displays in the front. But when it comes time to copulate, he has to go around the back. She's protected by the walls. 
which gives her a chance to pop out the front, which means that she can regard him and evaluate him at an intimate distance without ever sacrificing her freedom to make a choice, right? So the male makes the bower because the female likes it. It's her preferences that have shaped this, right? But as a result, that uh, leads to a new phenomenon, which is what I call aesthetic remodeling. She has transformed maleness in a way that allows for her aesthetic uh, uh, um, um, uh, pursuits in the absence of, uh, of sexual coercion, right? And, and, and what do female bowerbirds do with freedom of choice? They choose beauty. So now we're at the point where we have a scientific discovery that freedom of choice begets beauty in nature, right? You know, um, I hope I, that this has been uh, an interesting and new view. I want to dedicate this talk to the memory of Vern Locks, a dear friend of many people in the room. Uh, uh, Vern was also himself a natural gas. He filled the volume, whatever volume <laughs> that nature provided. A fantastic uh, 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 ornithologist and, and human and no greater lover of the, nature, the beauty of nature or the beauty of these islands uh, than Vern. And uh, thank you very much for your time and attention.